Hi, I'm Richard Morai, Senior Minister at Unity of Phoenix Spiritual Center, and I want to thank you for visiting our website and for tuning in to today's message. If you feel inspired by today's talk, I really encourage you to make a donation by hitting that button below and making a contribution to this ministry. It'll allow us to continue these messages online and to do the great work we do here at Unity of Phoenix, which is to inspire people to live better lives. So thanks for tuning in, thanks for your support, and we hope to see you at a Sunday real soon. All right, morning again, everyone. And a shout out to, to Jim and Ruth Green, who check us out and watch us from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Everybody wave to Jim and Ruth. Hey, thanks for watching, gang. Appreciate it. So uh, Adam is talking to God and says, uh, God, I really love this garden. I love this place. It's so beautiful. The landscapes, everything's so great. You know, the animals are fabulous, great, great food. And I'm having such a great time, but I got to admit, I'm feeling a little bit lonely. And so I'm not really feeling so happy. And God said, well, Adam, in that case, I've got the perfect solution. I shall create a woman for you. And Adam says, uh, what's a woman? And uh, God says, uh, this creature called woman will be the most intelligent, sensitive, caring, beautiful creature I have ever created. She will be so intelligent. <laughs> And there's more. And uh, she will be so intelligent, she will know and figure out what you need even before you ask. She will be so sensitive and caring that she will know your every mood and help you get to be happy again no matter what. Her beauty will rival the heavens and the earth, and she will be unquestionably caring for every need and desire you may ever have. She will be the perfect companion for you, and you will love her more than anything in life. And Adam says, wow, that sounds great, God. And God says, yes, she will be great and you'll be happier than you could, you'd ever dreamed of. But this is going to cost you, Adam. <laughs> and Adam says, how much is this woman going to cost me? And God says, she'll cost you an arm and a leg. <laughs> and Adam thinks about it and he says, so what can I get for a rib? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's a bad joke. Okay. That was bad, but this one's worse. And so, uh, so God's talking to, I mean, so Adam's talking to God and says, God, why'd you make Eve so beautiful? She's gorgeous. She's stunning. She's amazing. Why'd you make her so beautiful? And God said, I made her so beautiful so that you would love her. And then he says, but why did you make her not so smart? And he said, I made her not so smart so that she would love you. And so, um, <laughs> so we're talking about love. We're talking about love today, that crazy little thing called love. Because everybody wants love. It is the greatest thing that every one of us desire. You know, people that were always looking for love, we want to find love, we want to fall in love, stay in love, hold on to our love, keep our love alive, rekindle our love, renew our love. It's all about love. We love love. How many people would say by far that you do not doubt for a question that love is the greatest thing and the most important thing in our lives? Everybody? And how many people would say as important as love is, you would say, sometimes it's hard to love people. It's hard to love some people. Even people we love, it's hard to love. And how many people would agree that in some ways you know that you could love more fully and more deeply and more open-heartedly than you are loving right now? How many people would agree with that? You know, the greatest commandment is love. It is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others as ourselves. The Bible over and over again encourages us to love, commands us to love, directs us to love, tells us to love. Jesus said, you know, and now I give you this new commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. That it is about love. The highest purpose is love. The greatest practice is love. It adds meaning and fulfillment to our lives more than anything else. And yet, this thing is not easy, this thing called love. Sometimes love is painful and it hurts. You know, sometimes this love thing is so painful. Sometimes we want to shut down and close off our hearts. Sometimes we want to withhold our love and protect ourselves. You know, sometimes we just want to pack it in and say, I am just done with this love thing. 
How many people have ever been so hurt that you um, felt like giving up on love or closing your heart off to love? Anybody? I think we all have had that. You know, and so I've been reading a book called True Love by uh, the uh, Zen Buddhist uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. And it's called True Love, A Practice for Awakening the Heart. And I've really enjoyed this book and am enjoying this book. We'll do a two-week series on it starting today because it's got some powerful, simple insights on how to love more deeply, how to, do, how to love more fully. So recently, I purchased this cappuccino machine that I love it. It's amazing. It makes espresso, cappuccinos, lattes. It makes 16 different types of amazing specialty coffee. 16. It's amazing. It looks so simple. You press, you press a couple of buttons here. But, you know, it looked easy, but it wasn't so easy. <laughs> to, you know, and so I had to read and follow the directions. You know, I had to practice and operate and educate and train myself in how to operate this machine, the cappuccino machine, to get all the 16 coffees, all the best, out of the machine. And I would say in many ways, love is like a cappuccino machine. <laughs> that there are varieties of flavors of all kinds of loves. But you know the thing is, unlike a cappuccino machine, love and life doesn't come with an owner's manual for love. It doesn't come with an instruction book for love. We are told love is the greatest thing and to love one another, but how, how do we do that is not a, always expressed in an easy way. Thich Nhat Hanh says this. He says training is needed. We need to be trained and learn how to love properly. That we need to learn and practice and like any other skill, we have to hone our skills of love. We need to practice and improve our skills of love to develop and expand our capacity and our ability to love in a deeper and more caring way. It takes work to love. It takes education and practice and training for us to love and to love more deeply. How many people knows it would behoove you to learn to love a little deeper and know there's plenty of room to love deeper? than we're currently doing. So what I'd like to do is share some of the ideas in this fabulous book and ideas of how we can go a little deeper into our hearts to love more deeply and to love more fully. The first one sounds so simple and, and, and ridiculous, but it's true. And he said that the first thing we need to do to love more deeply and love more fully is to be more present. He said love is about being present and that sometimes um, we're not present. Sometimes we are not present in relationship. You know, and you can't love if you're not there. You know, that we have to be present to be able to, to, to love more fully and, and, and to engage with people. And we're not always there. Sometimes our body's there, but our minds not, are not always there. Sometimes our minds are on the past or the future or worrying or, 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 or preoccupied with some plans or angry or jealous. How many people have ever been uh, in, in engaged with someone and you could tell they weren't right, they weren't there, they weren't what, with you? And how many people have ever been engaged in a thing and you weren't there? Anybody, uh, you, know, you know, Woody Allen once said, 80% of success is just showing up. And sometimes we don't show up. Our bodies might be there, but we are not fully present. Fully present to others, fully present to ourselves, or even fully present to life. Our minds are so distracted and preoccupied that when we're there, we're actually not there. And when you're not there, you can't love. When you're not there, you can't connect. When you're not there, you can't bond. When you're not there, you can't care and share and encourage and experience authentic connection. It sounds simple. If you want to love, you've got to be there. We've got to be more present because what happens is if we're not present, we miss connection. We miss love. That we literally miss the opportunity to bond and feel a deeper level of intimacy and, and closeness and tenderness. And for most people, being present take, takes work. It takes work. And we have all kinds of excuses. Sometimes we're just distracted, but even when we're asked to be present, we come up with excuses. He tells a story about his son, and his father's very wealthy, and he's, son, you can have anything you want for your birthday. What do you want? I'll buy you anything. He says, Dad, I'd like you and I to spend some time and just be together. He says, son, you know, I'm really busy. I got a lot of work, got a lot of this, got to make money, got to blah, blah, blah. Remember the song, Cats in the Cradle? When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. So, so often we think we're working hard to provide for people, and yet we're missing connection. Why? Because we're not present. 
Sometimes we're eating breakfast and we're in the same room uh, with people and there's a newspaper, uh, you know, bl blocking uh, our connection. You ever see these days people are around a table and everybody's on their phone and they call it being alone together. <laughs> and the fact is that happens a lot, that we aren't present, that we aren't there for one another. So I want you to think of your most intimate relationship and ask yourself the question, is, is, how are you showing up? And is there a relationship that's important to you that you need to be a little bit more present for, a little bit more present to? Thich Nhat Hanh says this, that being there is an art. And the art, it is the art of meditation. Because meditation is bringing your true presence to the here and now. And he said it only takes a few minutes or seconds to actually get our body and our mind to, to the present. But we have to be willing uh, to commit to that. And he said, the link between the body and the mind is the breath. That it is through the breath that we can become more mindful and more present of the here and now. And he said, as simple as saying something like, um, I know I'm breathing in and breathing in, and I know I'm breathing out and breathing out. Okay, so let, let's, okay. I know I'm breathing in and breathe in. I know I'm breathing out and breathe out. Again, breathe again and breathe out. Feel your body as it breathes in. Feel your body as you breathe out. Again, I know I'm breathing in, breathe in. I know I'm breathing out, breathe out. And what he says is doing that for a couple of minutes begins to bring, bring us to a level of mindfulness and being present to where we are. And he says the mind is distracted so many times a day that every time we go into a, a, a connection with somebody we love, we should do that mindfulness to bring us back to the present, back to being fully uh, engaged uh, with that individual. And he says what happens is when we get a connection and a oneness with ourselves and we're present to someone, it is that is when we are most grounded, that we're most centered, that we're most at peace, that our hearts are most open, that we're most alive, engaged, and aware, and we are actually most available to actually be able to love, to actually be able to connect, to actually be able to feel intimacy and a real true bond and an experience of love. The mind will wander, and we have to keep going back to this mindfulness every time we engage with someone that we need to be able to be mindful and be fully present so we don't miss that connection. Because everybody wants love. And not being there misses the very thing we want. And so we need to be more conscious and more intentional in being present in all of our relationships, and particularly our most intimate, connected relationships. And so the second thing he says for us to love deeper is, is to understand. And there are two things we need to understand. The first one is to understand love in a better way and to understand what love is. And he says there are four elements in Buddhism to what love is. Number one, love is about kindness. It's about being kind and caring to someone else. Number two, it's about compassion. And that compassion is having a desire that someone's suffering is eased or their pain is eased. The third is joy. Love should bring joy. And not that every moment is, but overwhelmingly, there should be some joy when we love. And then the fourth one is freedom. When we love, the other person should be free. Free to be who they are, to feel safe to be who they are. So he said, what is not love is when we try to control someone, that's not freedom and that's not love. If we don't have compassion for someone and what they're going through, that's not love. If we're not feeling some joy and they're not feeling joy, that's not love. And if we're not being kind, that is not love. And he said, we need to measure ourselves and ask ourselves a question, am I truly living a life of love? Am I truly loving that person or those individuals in my life at this level and standard of what true love really is? And then the second thing he needs, we need to understand is we need to understand the people that we love. Here's what he says. He said, if you can't understand the person you love, then you can't love that person properly to bring out um, happiness and joy in them. That if we don't understand someone, what you know, what their suffering is, what their goals and dreams are, if we don't uh, understand what their troubles or how they receive information or their personality, then it's hard for us to actually love them. It's hard for us to really genuinely love them and support them in a way that makes a difference to them. You know, they usually say the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's really do unto others as, you, as they would like you to do unto them. Does that make sense? Okay. If it doesn't, just please nod because... Uh, <laughs> 
So one of the things you come to realize is that people are different. Sometimes people are shy. Sometimes people are insecure. Sometimes people are confident and loud and gregarious. And we need to love them in different ways. And the more we understand them, the better we can love them in greater ways. So often, we have the people in our lives, we try to mold them in how we think they should be. But every one of us has somebody in our life that we want to change, that we know that if they were just different and exactly the way we think they should be different, they would be a lot happier. How many people have somebody in your life you wish was a little different? You want to change them? Okay, only four of us admitted it, but that's okay. <laughs> and so, the, the, you know, it, it is amazing how we spend energy wanting to change someone instead of actually understanding them and accepting them and loving the way in the way that will work best for them is that we always try to change them. So I'm from a family of 10 kids, five boys, five girls, 10 kids. And so... What is, we have a brother that was just a little out there, a little unusual. And so the other nine of us were always trying to tell him to be different than he was. His whole life. You know, up until maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago, then my eldest brother, we're talking on the phone, and saying, oh, he needs to do this and stop doing that. And then my brother says, no, you don't. All we need to do is love him. To accept and understand that's how he is. And you know, all nine of us stopped putting out that energy of you need to be different in who you are and just understood and accepted him. And you know what? Today he's happier than he's ever been because we, that energy of wishing you were different really impacts someone. It impacts relationships. So now that we just love and accept him the way it is, the guy's as joyful and wonderful as ever. You know, there's less stress and resistance and tension in the relationships because we're not trying to make him be other than he is. So if we want to love more deeply, we need to, A, understand what love is, that love is joy and it gives freedom. It's about compassion and kindness, but also understand the people that you love. They're unique. And when we understand them more, we'll learn how to speak in a way that'll, that they'll be able to receive and understand. We'll know what their love language is, so we'll be able to support them, whether it's with words or actions or whatever it is, so that they really feel the love we have in our hearts for them. And then the third thing is that we need to practice love. We gotta practice. We gotta work on it and invest some time and energy in, in, into loving. And Buddhism, they, they, they do mantras. And a mantra is a statement. He calls it a magic formula that when, you're utter, when you utter it from a place of being present, being uh, in the here and now, being mindful, that that um, statement, he said, can change situations and change people. But we've got to be always mindful. We always have to go back to this mindful practice before every interaction until it becomes uh, the norm. But he said there are four magical mantras we've got to practice. And the first one is that once we, we, we breathe and are connecting with our body and feeling a sense of oneness and are present, the first one is, dear one, I am here for you. It's to literally, and say it to ourselves, we have to say it to them, that I am here for you. And you know what that's for? It's for us. It's to say, I'm here to take a stand for love. I am here to invest time in, in, in being present um, to love, and I want to show up in a greater way in this relationship. So this first mantra is really about our commitment that I'm willing to show up in love, that I'm willing to take a stand for love, and I'm willing to invest the time to be present uh, to this relationship and this situation. You know, anybody know Chandra Rhimes, who she is? So she's the one who produced like Grey's Anatomy and um, How to Get Away with Murder and what's that other one? Scandal, all on Thursday. So hugely successful. And she was, I read a fabulous article and saw an interview with her and she said she lost her mojo. You know, she's hugely successful, blah, 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 single mom with kids. And she always found that she didn't have time for her kids and decided she's out of her groove. Let her make a commitment to one year. Kids ask her to play, she's saying yes. She's not saying I'm too busy. So uh, first in her head, she's saying, oh, man, that's going to take a lot of time. I miss meetings, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, she leaves a, goes to leave the house. Kids say, hey, bye, bye, mom, hey, can you play with us? She says yes. And what she found was being present with them was an amazing experience, and it didn't take as much effort or time. In fact, they got bored with her after four minutes. And... Um, <laughs> She worked all three of them, and by nine minutes, she was done, but, uh, or they were done with her. But what she found was that she had this, all these ideas of what the commitment it would take, that, what would I, if I, that I don't have enough time. She did have enough time. She had enough time for her kids. She had enough time for her work, and she found her groove back, and she was more joyful than ever. And the question is, who 
are you needing to spend time with? And are you willing to do that first mantra to say, dear one, I am here for you. I am willing to take a stand for love. I'm willing to show up in a better way and to invest my time in being fully present for you. So who is it do you need to show up for? And are you willing to make that commitment for yourself? The second one is, uh, the second mantra after you do your mindfulness stuff is, uh, dear one, I know you are here and it makes me very happy. One of the things that people uh, happen sometimes is that people don't feel like they're seen. They don't feel like they're heard. They don't feel like they're acknowledged or they don't feel like they are recognized. And sometimes we don't mean to do it, but sometimes we can have people in the same room and feel like the other person isn't acknowledging them or isn't connected to them in any way. You know, and so it's important for us to begin to recognize. And you have to be there. Let me give you an example. There can be a beautiful sunset, but if you don't recognize it, then you don't experience it. You could, the stars can be out at night, but if you don't recognize it and acknowledge it, you miss that experience. And so what we need to do is to begin to, to look at someone and, and say, I know you are here, and I'm very glad about it. And so this uh, weekend, there was nobody at home for me to do this to, so I started looking around. There are other things at my house, and I, I, I saw this, be- I've got this beautiful, like, orange poinsettia, and I said, beautiful orange poinsettia, I know you're here, and that makes me very happy. <laughs> I have this purple orchid. I said, purple orchid, I know you are here, and that makes me very happy. I said, cappuccino machine that makes six different types of coffee. I know you are here, and that makes me very happy. I just renovated my entire kitchen. And I said, whirlpool refrigerator that gives me water with crushed or cubed ice by pressing a button. I know you're here, and that makes me very happy. And it seems, I started saying, kitchen window that allows me to see into my backyard and see how bright outside is. I know you are here, and that makes me happy. It seems silly, but all of this made me more aware of how blessed I am. It made me more engaged. You know what he says about mindfulness? It makes you touch life more deeply. Because when you are mindful, you are engaged, you are alive, you are more connected, you are more present to share an experience, this amazing gift called life. There's an interaction that when you begin to recognize what's there, who's there, to acknowledge it and say how important it is to you, and how glad you are that it is in your life, even an inanimate object, you will feel more love, you will feel more alive, you will feel more connected. Could you imagine doing the very same thing in your mind to your loved one? If to literally look at them in your mind's eyes, say, I know you are here, dear one, and that makes me very happy. Because I guarantee you, even if you don't speak a word, they'll feel it. We've all felt when someone isn't there, but I guarantee, even without words, but I guarantee you, you'll feel it. Uh, and experience it uh, if you uh, make that deeper connection. You know, there's something uh, really amazing. And, uh, you know, when, in the Bible, when it says, no greater love than this than a man who would lay down his life for another, and it doesn't mean you catch a bullet or jump in front of a bus. It means that when you lay your, lo- your, your, your concerns to the side, to be present to someone, that's when miracles happen. That's when connection and intimacy happens. The next one is, dear one, I know you are suffering, and this is why I am here for you. Living mindfully, we pay attention, and, and when we, we realize that our loved one is hurting. Sometimes when we do pay attention, people are hurting right around us, and we don't even know it. We don't even acknowledge it because we're not there. And one of the greatest things is to have a loved one during a time of pain say, I'm here for you. To say, to hug them, or to hold them, or to pat them on the back. Just to express any level of care makes a difference. I've known people in the hospital who were in a coma and they had friends visit and were present and they didn't say anything, they didn't think they were conscious and the person in the coma later said, I could feel it and it made a difference. I've been on both sides of the bed in a hospital. I remember there were t- when I was uh, hospitalized, my friends came to visit, didn't say a word, I wasn't in a place to visit, but I, I could feel their love and their presence just in that room, not even saying anything, but just being there. Doing something kind, saying an encouraging word, It is amazing when someone is suffering, just being there for them and helping them makes an absolute difference. It's miraculous the power we have to connect and transform people's lives by just being there when they're hurting. 
You know, our chaplains make phone calls once a month, and there are some chaplains who have never met the people, and what they do is they leave a message, and so that for a couple of years, they've had voice messages, and people come up to me and say, I love my chaplain, I've never met them, but they leave these beautiful messages, and they make a difference for me, and especially when things aren't going well. And so my question, who in your life is suffering, and are you willing to just allow yourself to be present for them? And here's the toughest one, uh, he says, is the fourth mantra is, dear one, I'm suffering, Please help me. And sometimes when a loved one has hurt us and we feel hurt by that loved one, the first thing we want to do is shut down and run away and close off and build up a wall to protect ourselves. And you see, we need to let that go and go to the loved one and say, I'm hurting. Can we talk about this? Can you help me move through this in a greater way? And he said that takes courage to be vulnerable, to open yourself and authentically share where you are with that person Because to run away just builds a wall and distance and disconnect. But to actually go and have the courage to share with that person and say, I need your help. Help me understand this. Help me move through this. And actually creates more intimacy and connection. So often we have misunderstandings with people and we don't talk. And it builds more uh, misunderstanding and more problems and more issues. And so to literally be able to say, I'm suffering, you know, can you help me? You absolutely w- would be able to transform things in a greater way. And then the final one is to talk about listening. I believe there's no greater power to heal relationships and to bring people closer than to genuinely listen. So often we want to be understood and not understand. And we need to take more time to understand and not just be understood. Thich Nhat Hanh says, as he says, if people have to go to the therapist, it's because our relationships that we don't listen in them or we don't feel heard by the people in our lives. He said, if we listen to one another, that we would be healthier, that we'd be happier, that we would feel more connection, that the pain that we often hide and that builds up would go away if we would genuinely take time to just listen to one another. It is the worst of all of our communication skills is to listen. We don't listen well. They say we're either speaking or we're waiting to speak, but uh, somehow listening doesn't always get there. But to be heard, but to literally be heard and, and to be able to share what's going on with ourselves is one of the safest loving things you can do. That's why Paul Tillich, the 1930s, 40s theologian said, the first law of love is to listen. If the first law of love is to listen, think about this. The greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is to love others as ourselves. If listening is the first law of love, then this should also make sense if we substitute love for listening. How about this? The first commandment could be listen to the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and listen to others as you listen to yourself. Could you imagine if we listen to ourselves better? Could you imagine if we listen to one another better? Can you imagine how different life would be if we listened to God better? Listening is a powerful thing, so who would it behoove you to listen to, including yourself, in a greater way? Because I guarantee you, it will heal and transform and bring a greater connection. Love isn't an easy thing, but it is the most powerful thing in life. And like a cappuccino machine or anything else, we need some instruction. We need some guidance. We need to hone the skills of love and to practice them and improve on them to deepen our ability to love more fully and more freely. This week, I invite you to practice these things. Be present in your relationship. Do the mindful breathing before you interact with a, with, uh, you know, with a clear intention that I am here for you. you know, be, uh, understand the person. Be willing uh, to, to understand them and understand what love is. Practice these mantras, and more than anything else, listen with an open, loving heart. And I'll guarantee you, your relationships will improve, and you will discover the blessings and the joys of true love. God bless you all.